Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 30th meeting of 2018. There are no apologies. Agenda item one is an evidence session with the Scottish Government Bill Team for the Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Scotland Bill. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And I welcome Karen Auchincloss, Criminal Justice Division, Leslie Baga, Criminal Justice Division, and Louise Miller, Dire uh, Miller Directorate of Legal Services with the Scottish Government. And Karen, I believe you're going to, to make an opening statement. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, convener and committee members. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to make an opening statement on the bill. The main purpose of the bill is to improve how children, in the first instance, and vulnerable witnesses participate in our criminal justice system by enabling the much greater use of pre-recording their evidence in advance of trial. The bill builds on the work of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Services Evidence and Procedure Review, which made recommendations on how to improve the treatment of vulnerable witnesses in the Scottish criminal justice system. Those recommendations included proposals on how to protect vulnerable witnesses, focusing on children in the most serious cases from further traumatisation by introducing a new rule that they will pre-record their evidence. Therefore, the main reform in the Bill is to create a new rule for children under 18, both complainers and witnesses, in order to ensure that where they are due to give evidence in the most serious of cases, they will have it pre-recorded unless an exception applies. The new rule applies to solemn cases only. Members will therefore have noted that the Bill does not make any provision in relation to summary cases. However, it is currently possible in a summary case to pre-record under the current legislative provisions. The Bill also does not extend the new rule to child accused. This was considered, but it was decided that it was not appropriate given the practical issues in doing so, and those issues are expanded upon in the policy memorandum. Again, it is important to note that under the current legislative provisions, the evidence of an accused person can be pre-recorded. The Bill does, however, include a power for the proposed new rule to be extended to adult deemed vulnerable witnesses in solemn cases. This could potentially include, include complainers in sexual offence, human trafficking, stalking and domestic abuse cases. The Scottish Government considers that these categories of witness would also greatly benefit from the greater use of pre-recording. And this power therefore ensures that the bill's most significant reform can be extended beyond child witnesses in due course. As committee members will be aware, evidence by commissioner is a special measure that is used to allow for evidence to be pre-recorded in advance of the criminal trial. The benefits of this are that the date and time for evidence by commissioner can be scheduled in advance, avoiding uncertainty for vulnerable witnesses. The atmosphere is also less formal than in full, full court proceedings, and evidence can be recorded directly or via remote video link from another location. This evidence is then used and played at trial without the witness having to be present. The bill also removes any legislative barriers that may have a detrimental effect on the greater use of pre-recorded evidence, which means that, if appropriate, a commission could happen prior to service of an indictment. Although, as committee members will note from the policy memorandum, in the short to medium term, it is considered that applications for evidence by a commissioner to be taken in advance of the indictment are likely to be rare. The concept of a ground rules hearing is also introduced by the Bill. This is to ensure that all parties are prepared and the issues set out in the practice note are considered. It is important to note, however, that the Bill provides the flexibility for the ground rules hearing to be conjoined with another hearing, if appropriate to do so. The Bill also makes provision with regards to the role of the Commissioner. This is to ensure that the Commissioner has the same powers as a judge to review the arrangements for a vulnerable witness giving evidence and to encourage that we are reasonably practical to do so, that is, it is the same judge who undertakes the ground rules hearing and the Commission. Finally, the Bill makes provision for a new simplified intimation process for a standard special measures for child and deemed vulnerable adult witnesses. Where it applies, this will streamline the current process by making it more an administrative rather than a judicial process. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Move straight to questions before I do so. Can I? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. John. Thank you, Kavina. Uh, good morning, panel, and thanks for your opening statement, Karen. I wonder if you could outline the special measures that are in place at the moment and how the bill will affect those, please. The bill is 
actually change the current special measures as they operate at the moment. So you have um, standard special measures, which are ones that are witnesses automatically entitled to. So that would be a screen, a supporter and a TV link. Then we have non-standard special measures, which are made on application. So that would be um, evidence by commissioner or use of a prior statement. So that's something that's been recorded before, whether or not that's written down, or it could be in the form of um, what, what's known as a joint investigative interview, where that's a police and a social work interview. Um, so that's that's. The, the bill doesn't actually change the operation of how um, special measures work at the moment. What it does, though, is it creates a new rule, new rule that in certain circumstances um, the position is that a child under 18 would, would have their um, evidence pre-recorded by using the special measure of evidence by commissioner. And just for the ones doubt, it's most definitely under 18? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, moving on, Shona. Uh, just on the, the pre-recording of, of, of evidence, um, can you say a little bit more about the, the main benefits of pre-recording evidence? I mean, obviously, the, you know, we're aware of um, the obvious benefits of removing um, the vulnerable person from a stressful situation, but it would be useful if you could expand a bit on that and how the bill seeks uh, to encourage the, the greater use of pre-recorded evidence. Yeah, obviously, as I touched upon in the opening statement, um, mm -hmm. the, the commission is scheduled so the, the witness knows exactly um, when the commission is taking place, mm -hmm. so it takes away that uncertainty right. of timings. Mm -hmm. um, it is certainly meant to be a less formal um, environment for a child or, or a witness giving evidence. Um, the, the bill is creating the framework, I think, for the greater use of pre-recorded evidence. But behind that is obviously, members will be aware that Lady Dorian introduced a revised practice note last year, which was to encourage um, the greater use. And it's actually quite a comprehensive practice note. So it sets out in great detail things that the court and the parties should be considering before a witness gives evidence. So it, it could include something like removal of wigs and gowns. Um, it could include the location of where the, the witness is giving evidence. Um, and also for the witness, I think, pre-recording your evidence in advance of the trial, the trial could be some months later, but for that witness on that day, it means that that's the end of the process for them. Yes, just to follow up on that mm -hmm. as well. Thanks. It currently happens under the new guidance in the High Court Practice Note, but in the bill as well as um, a grounds rule hearing, which would have to happen before the commission takes place, and it can be incorporated into a preliminary hearing. And basically that means there's a lot of focus on making sure the parties are ready, um, actually on what kind of questioning would be, everything's appropriate, whether there needs to be breaks. So it actually makes it much more focused for when the, the child or vulnerable witness is giving evidence before that actually happens. So that's actually an added um, scrutiny and getting ready for it than probably would happen at the moment. OK. Um, can I just ask a little bit more about the, the, the plans for phasing in uh, the proposed rule. We talked in the initial statement about the, the power would be taken to potentially expand. It would be helpful to hear a little bit about what what would be the um, a realistic time frame and was the reason for having the initial focus and having the power to expand what was the reasoning behind that? Was it to do it in an orderly fashion or were there, you know, capacity issues? What was the kind of reasoning for, for doing it in that, that way? Uh, the, but the bill, obviously, um, the main focus is on children because we wanted to start somewhere. We wanted to target the most vulnerable. And um, that's not to say that other people aren't vulnerable as well. Um, and I think... I accept that some stakeholders would, would like it to go a little bit further and a little bit quicker. Um, but I think it's really one of the fundamentals is this is actually quite a, a significant change to how evidence is taken at the moment. Um, I think it's important to get it right. I think it's important for the practice note to bed in, for people to get used to, to this way of working. Um, and we accept and recognise that, you know, other uh, categories of witness would would, uh, would benefit from, from this special measure and the way it's taken as well. But I think we're really quite keen to ensure that we get it right from the very beginning. Um, and the danger is if we expanded it too quickly, um, then that's not going to be to the benefit of, of any of the witnesses. So we um, are working with stakeholders at the moment on what a potential implementation plan could look like. Um, the bill has... Mm -hmm. Uh, various powers within it on how that power could be used, whether or not you target certain cases for 
um, adult and vulnerable witnesses or specific locations. Um, so we're very, very mindful that a lot of people um, would like the bill to come in very quickly, but I think it's important that we don't rush um, too quickly. So, so when do you think that implementation plan will be ready and presumably would have some broad time frames attached to it? When, when do you think the implementation plan will be ready? Well, as I say, we're working with stakeholders at the moment right. on potential implementation. So perhaps when the Cabinet Secretary comes after the year to give evidence, he might be in a, a position to, to update the, the committee. Okay. It's the one thing we, we have learned in all of our discussions and actually from what's happening in other jurisdictions as well, is actually how important it is, even if you have an ambition on what to do, to actually time doing it, make sure it's done properly, but also to have monitoring and evaluation time set in. So because obviously this is dealing with very vulnerable people, we absolutely have to get it right. And even though, as Karen said, set out earlier, Evans by Commissioner has been around for a number of years. It has been used relatively infrequently and therefore we cannot um, say enough how much actually what's being proposed here is a very substantial and significant change. Um, it obviously will depend on the views of this committee and the Parliament, but it's proposing bringing in a legal rule, which in a sense is relatively inflexible and can have a, make a massive, massive change. So we have to make sure it's right and it's not just about legislative change, it's about making sure all the practical changes to go along with it are done as well. So um, we're in close contact as well with um, our counterparts down in um, London who have been doing pilots on their section 27, section 28 version of pre-recording evidence. And certainly one of the big lessons we've learned from them is it probably takes even longer than you think. And to get it right, make sure you build in time through all the stages and monitor and evaluate, learn from that and then roll out to the next stages. So to say the government's current position is that the initial focus should be on children. Um, that came out through the procedure review and also the work that we've done, but for a power in the future. But that will have to be very carefully evaluated and considered. And obviously it's a matter for the parliament and ministers ultimately. Okay, okay thank you. Liam MacArthur, supplementary. Thanks very much. Ray. Good morning. Uh, just going back to the point you were making in relation to the ground rules here and the importance of of that. Uh, we've had some um, discussion uh, earlier this morning about uh, how lines of inquiry can be pursued where you ag agree questioning in advance, but dependent on the answer you receive from, from a witness, you, you may um, feel that you need to kind of pursue uh, a, a line of questioning that wasn't uh, perhaps as, as, as predictable from the outset. Will the guidance notes uh, be expected to, to cover how that should be handled, or is that likely to, to fall to the discretion um, of, 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 of those conducting the, the commissioning? Yeah, I think it would probably fall to the discretion, um, you know, whether, whether or not you think you would maybe need to um, have the witness back, or I mean, that's certainly a matter for the court. We, when we were um, looking into developing the policy for the ground rules hearing, we actually took quite a lot from how they operate down south, which is quite similar. Um, and in fact, down there, I think that it's a prerequisite. They actually have to hand in, write all the questions down. Um, and speaking to them, we did raise the, quest the question that is, is there an, ever a situation where maybe some other disclosure is made or somebody says something that's not expected? But the feedback we've got from them is because parties are fully considering all the issues um, and they're looking at all the evidence and disclosure that they have, that it tends to be that when those questions are asked and, and the witness um, is asked, that um, that's not actually been an issue that's come up in the past, but certainly it's, it's something that perhaps could happen. I mean, it tends to be for grounds for hearing. It's the, often you could supply questions, and that might be something that the High Court ultimately thinks is appropriate, but it's also often the broad content of the areas, uh, making sure there are going to be questions that the child can actually understand. And I would thought it would be possible during actual commission, if something comes up unexpected, um, given the, the commissioner, who is a judge or a sheriff, is there as well, to say, I'd like to know can I pursue this kind of line of questioning? There's still flexibility. The one thing we've been keen to stress with any of these proposals, nothing in this is about stopping legitimate testing of an evidence, um, the witness of a, of, a, of a, the evidence of a witness, because clearly that is key and absolutely important. It's actually just about getting the best evidence out and making sure it's in a more controlled environment, but it's not about limiting cross-examination in any way. Presumably the other end of the spectrum is that where an answer isn't provided either because the, the, the child either can't recollect yes. or is, is uncertain, there'd be limitations on, on how far that could be pursued at, 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 at some presumably relatively early point, there'd be an agreement that the answer is what the, the, the child has provided. Yeah. Yeah. And just in terms of the, the expansion you were talking about of a procedure that's currently used but nothing like to the extent that's anticipated, what, what are the, the, the financial implications of that? I mean, what the, what the Court and Tribunal Service saying about, albeit in a phased um, process where the valuation is taking 
place um, before the, the kind of next phase is rolled out. Do they believe that they, they've got the resources at the moment to manage that process through to conclusion, or will that depend on the evaluation um, that takes place um, subject to their legislation then coming in? Yeah, I mean, the financial memorandum sets out um, the estimated costs, and you'll probably see that um, it's, it's set out in a range because we, we just don't know at this stage you know, how many will actually go on to give evidence by commissioners. So for children, I think it starts off from about half a million, and if it was all children being cited, it goes up to about three and a half million. If you then extend that into the adult de deemed vulnerable witnesses, again, it's very much an estimate because we don't know at this point how many would go on. Um, the, the costs go up to about 14 million. So clearly there are, there are significant resource implications for the court service, for Crown Office, um, for the Legal Aid Board. Um, so, you know, the costs are set out um, in the financial memorandum, but um, obviously decisions um, that are taken in the spending review are, uh, will come out in due course. And in terms of the, the, the equipment that's needed and all the rest of it, that, I mean, that is it's an expansion of what's currently used as opposed to this requiring a different um, series of, of, of equipment and technology and whatever. Absolutely yeah. correct. And actually, it's a very important point. Because it's not used so much now, the court service absolutely have recognised they actually need to look at their whole venues and IT and upgrading it and making sure it's ready. If this, um, these proposals get passed, you'll probably recently see there was um, Scottish Government announced funding. I think it was £950,000 for um, facilities in Glasgow to actually be upgraded to have um, vulnerable witness hearing suites and sensory rooms and actually be really state of the art to actually start taking more evidence by commissioners. And we're certainly very closely involved with the court service about looking now at other areas and possibly also mobile equipment. So that work is actually a really important work stream alongside legislation to make sure there's actually the practical infrastructure. And I'm sure when court service come along to give evidence, they can give you a lot more detail on the kind of work that they're, they're doing, because they're, um, they're certainly doing a lot on that right now. Um, if I take any supplementaries, could you make them absolutely on point to make sure that we're not straying into other areas that we want to cover in, in a particular order? Um, Jenny. Good morning to the panel. Um, I just want to cover the reasons for not applying the proposed rule on pre-recording evidence to, to the child accused. I think that's covered by subsection 7 and 8 of the bill. Um, so subsection 7 says that it will apply an exemption if the giving of all the child witnesses' evidence in advance of the hearing would give rise to a significant risk of prejudice to the fairness of that hearing. Um, and subsection 8... Um, C says it would be in the child's witness best interest to give evidence at the hearing. So who, who makes that judgment? Or did you, was the first part in relation to child accused? I, I don't know. It was just Sorry, in, in, relation in, the yeah, in relation to child accused. So there's obviously exceptions that, that exist within the legislation as it currently stands. Yes, yeah, so the, the bill doesn't extend the new rule to, to child accused at all. They are not within the scope of the bill. The exceptions apply for um, the children under 18 who would be caught by the new rule. OK, so well, with regard to those children then? Oh, so those exceptions, they are actually extremely very tightly drawn. Um, I wouldn't envisage actually a situation where they would be applied, but it's actually just to give a little bit of flexibility in, for the interests of justice or if there was a significant risk to the, the fairness of a trial. But the, the position will be, in, in the vast majority of cases, that the children will be um, under 18 in those um, cases that are listed in the bill, give, give pre-recorded evidence. And in terms of that risk to the fairness of the trial, then, who makes that overall judgment? Who does that decision rest with? I think that would, that would rest with the courts and the judge. Okay, right. And in terms of the current and expected future use of prior statements then, I think, um, Leslie, you, you alluded to there being more evidence perhaps in terms of evidence gathering by the Commissioner. You expect that to, to happen. It already is happening. Okay. Do you expect it to continue at the same level um, or to increase? Yeah. In terms of, because pre-recording can happen a number of ways, mm -hmm. um, pre-recording in terms of actually what would happen to have all the child's evidence given advance of the trial, it could happen by a prior statement, which Karen touched on. A prior statement is when it's just the, the child or the witness's evidence in chief that's actually recorded. That can happen in written or video recording. In Scotland, there's less use of um, video recording by the police, but there is one circumstance when it does happen um, more often, and that's in what's called a joint investigative interview. And that's led by the police and social work, where they interview and record the child's evidence. But there also has to be child protection issues, so they're also looking at it from that point of view. So that ultimately could be introduced as part of the child's pre-recording as a prior statement, but it doesn't cover the cross-examination or the re-examination. So that could be done by the process of evidence by a commissioner 
or you could actually have all of the witnesses' evidence gathered by Evans by a commissioner. It is just the one hearing where actually they could actually ask um, various questions and record all of the evidence and have that recorded for the trial. So there's a number of different mechanisms to actually have it pre-recorded in advance. Please, Rona. Oh, sorry, sorry, Jenny, you're not finished. Point M, can you give an update perhaps with regard to the development of the national standards for joint investigative um, uh, investigations as well? Because I know that was a recommendation made in 2017. Yes, that's right. That was a recommendation by um, one of the subgroups from the Evidence and Procedure Review. And there is a lot of work on going by on that at the moment. I think the main bits they're looking at as well is because, as you'll, you'll be aware, there was areas of good practice for joint investigative interviews, but there was actually a lot of areas where they felt it could be improved, particularly, I think there's some of it, the IT, but also in the training and the guidance. So there's a lot of work that's undergoing right now. My understanding is it's actually, I think, mainly focusing on the the training that's going to be taking place for people who actually conduct these kind of interviews. And um, yeah, they're doing a revised model to develop a training programme, but they also intend to design national standards. So all of that work is going along in sync, very much uh, in tune with the greater idea of greater pre-recording, that we have to actually get them up to being the best quality they can. So um, there's already been a lot of work ongoing on that, and it'll carry on. OK, thank you. Supplementary, Rona, then Fulton. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, Karen, in your opening statement, you mentioned that the policy memorandum outlined reasons why the bill didn't extend to child accused. I wonder if you could very briefly just bullet point the reasons why that would be? Yes. I mean, a child accused obviously has a, a completely different status for, from a witness. So, for example, they already have um, access to legal representation. They also do have a choice whether or not to give evidence or not. Um, as I said earlier, it's, it's technically possible for an accused person to pre-record. To our knowledge, it has never, ever happened before. Um, so the decision was taken that you know, it, it wouldn't seem sensible to apply a rule um, to a category um, of person when the special measure is available and it's never been used. Um, we've done further work over the summer with a lot of stakeholders, um, and actually some of it's just been published now online, and, and that sort of touched on, and I think there was a recognition that you know, pre-recorded wouldn't, wouldn't really work for an accused. But the, what did come out of that was actually around wider support that perhaps child, child accused uh, need. So I think that's something that we'll have to, we'll have to take back and consider. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was, it's a lot of work was done on it because actually when we did our Scottish Government consultation there was um, a lot of favour about actually including child accused. But when we actually practically started looking at it and actually speaking to people, you actually raised in practical terms it could be very, very prejudicial because uh, normally an accused person would on advice of legal counsel, and this includes children, decide not whether to give evidence or not once they've heard all the Crown evidence against them. If you pre-record it, you're actually having it done in advance. And of course, all the other advantages that I know were asked about earlier for pre-recording in terms of knowing you don't have to attend at the trial, not being there. And a, an accused person has to be there. They have to listen to it. They are in the courtroom. So none of those advantages are there, but you could prejudice them. And that would go very much against the heart of the policy about having the best interest of the child involved. So. And as Karen says, actually, from talking to people, actually, once we've actually talked through it, a really general consensus has grown that actually pre-recordings would be not the answer. Just on the point of supporting the child accused, we did hear during a visit to the High Court yesterday that there are things that could be done now, with things, you know, that actually without any bringing them into the bill, that aren't being done. Like they don't have to be in court; they could be in a separate room listening to the, the evidence and things like that. So that obviously, that's a, a bigger question for the legal. It's, it's not to do with your bill. Okay, thank you. Fulton. Yeah, thanks, Convener. I've got, um, hey, good morning, panel. I've got a supplementary on the supplementary first and then, and then back to Jenny. <laughs> so, um, it was about the, the child accused. Is, it, is the rules around child accused been taken, uh, taken into cognizance? The, um, the current bill that's gone through the Equalities and Human Rights Committee on the Age of Criminal Responsibility? Yeah, we certainly work closely with Scottish mm. uh, government officials across, um, especially when there's um, connected policy interests. Um, so, yeah, we, we have been engaging with them. As I said, and Leslie touched on, um, the, while we recognise that pre-recording probably is not the best special measure, I think there um, is a lot of maybe wider work in terms of support that actually would, would benefit from further consideration. Yes, it, certainly what, what, what I've seen on that, it, it does seem to fit into the ethos of, of that bill that's gone through. Um, the, my, my other question, um, convener, is around the, the joint investigative interviews. I should declare an interest as a, a registered social worker and I've, I've been involved in uh, joint investigative interviews in the past. I'm, I'm just interested in how often they're used just now as um, pre-recorded evidence. You might not have exact stats, but roughly how uh, 
much of these? I'd probably be guessing, to be honest, if I gave you a number, so it's probably better we, we write to you with more specific information. Um, what I do understand, though, is actually they happen a lot more than they're actually admitted into court at the moment. And I think part of the reason for that is maybe um, the quality is not quite good enough to actually meet the test that would be needed to be a prior statement in court. So there's a number of the ones that already happen, and obviously they'd have to ultimately court case. But my understanding is that um, quite a lot of them don't end up actually being the evidence. And that's the bit that's wanted to be changed, is to actually get that quality up. I mean, would you like us to go and find out numbers and just write to the committee with numbers on the number, if, if they exist? We can certainly try and do that. Oh, yes, please. Mm -hmm. OK, Good. moving on to Daniel. Um, well, I'd just like to really ask about some of the, the, the nuts and bolts. But before I do, I mean, as you've already said, this is in some ways is formalising existing practice and seeking to extend it. I mean, again, at the risk of asking another numbers question, I mean, I mean what sorts of volumes are currently, or, or, of children are currently giving evidence through these sorts of special uh, measures? And, 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 and how many more will benefit following the passage of the bill? Um, well, since the introduction, what well, well, the practice note was revised, I think the numbers were extremely low. Yeah. Um, but since the introduction of the practice note, the, the numbers have been steadily increasing. And I think from April 2018 to August 2018, there were 82 applications for evidence by commissioner in the High Court. 71 of those were for children and 11 were for adults. So clearly, uh, the, the numbers are going up. I think it's important to recognise it's not just about the numbers going up, but it's about improving the overall quality sure. and the consistency across the board. And um, if passed um, the bill in its current form, then the numbers will be into, well, for children, I think at the maximum it was about 759 children. And then you're talking um, about a couple of thousand for adult deemed vulnerable witnesses. So the, the numbers that you know would, would result from the bill are, are quite significant, but it's very encouraging to see that since the practice note that the numbers have, have steadily been increasing. Yeah. And just to give a bit further context to that, those 82 applications, that's just for a five-month five month period from April, but actually for the previous period from April 2017 to March 2018 for the High Court practice notes, first of all came in, there were 62. So you can see that's almost a year and there's already been quite a substantial increase. Um, it has to be said, nothing compared to the increase that's actually under the proposals, which is why it's such a significant change. But even that is seen as quite a big change to actually to be, to get used to and have everything being set up for. So it's, it's already the High Court practice note appears to be having a positive effect. I mean, that's a very useful context. I mean, obviously you've stated uh, that, that this is going to be dealing with uh, solemn cases. I mean, could you just maybe explain the rationale for, for not extending this to uh, more, more broadly into summary and indeed, you know, sheriff court cases, which was probably a, a much larger numbers uh, again? I think, as I said earlier, the bill really is is a framework for to, to encourage and start the greater use of pre-recording evidence. We have focused on the, the most serious of cases um, because we believe that's probably an appropriate place to start. However, um, if it was deemed appropriate, the special measure could be used um, in the Sheriff Court at summary level, but as you touched upon, um, the numbers in the in the summary court, at, uh, the Sheriff Court at summary level are um, significantly higher um, than for solemn cases at the moment. So, w would the government be looking to review this in the future and about how that practice might be able to extend it either through non-legislative means or indeed legislative means if that's required? Certainly, since the practice note has come in, there has been um, a period of monitoring review by court service, and obviously we have an interest in that. When the bill, if it's passed in its current form, uh, we start to, to commence various powers, there would be a period of continuous monitoring and evaluation. And as I said, this is actually what, what the ultimate aim is, is that this actually does become the norm but it will take a little bit of time. It's a culture and a practice thing. And because it, the current special measures of evidence by commissioner are already in legislation, it's not that we would need to bring forward any more legislation. I think it exists so people could use it. It's also the case about, and this is obviously a matter for the parliament, when it's appropriate to have a rule that can be relatively inflexible and when it's actually better to be left on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. As um, my colleague says, it's possible in summary cases to apply for it if it's a very appropriate case. But in terms of the bill's proposals, as well as the current proposal for children under 12 in certain solemn cases, it's proposed to take quite wide powers in that respect to even remove the list of offences, which could ultimately have it occur, um, applying to all children under 18 in High Court and in Shor Sheriff Solemn cases, which would actually be massive, as well as extending it to adult deemed vulnerable witnesses. Now, 
this is actually already, even just the proposal for the first bit, a big, big change. Mm -hmm. Even going down those lines would be huge. So there's a bit of managing expectations as well about how far this rule can go and how quickly it can go that, that we need to do. Can I just go into the, um, the uh, ground rules hearings? Because having had the discussion yesterday with uh, people at the, the High Court, and indeed from your evidence, that, that's actually really critical um, to sort of establishing kind of how the, the evidence will be taken, actually is sort of making sure that the sensitivities we all hope will, will be there are there. And I think having just heard from, from Rona Mackay about sometimes people don't know to ask for particular provisions or approaches to be taken in court, what sort of safeguards are, are in place to make sure that those questions are asked, that you're not just simply relying on both the Defence Council and the prosecution to know to ask the right things or indeed to agree to a particular approach. I mean, what, what would stop this in many years down the line being taken advantage of by, you know, you know particularly aggressive Defence Council who just simply doesn't agree to, to particular lines of questioning or approach? Yeah, I mean, the practice note is really comprehensive um, and I think at the heart of it is actually putting the, the vulnerable witness um, and, and their needs first. Um, the practice note also references what's called, I don't know if you're familiar, but it's the Advocates Gateway, which is a, it's something that they use down in England and Wales, and it's a comprehensive training for um, advocates and how to, to cross-examine children. Um, and very much, if that practice note is being followed, is, is, for a, mat is a matter for, for the judge in, in each case. But as I understand it, um, the feedback that we've had from um, the practice note, and since the numbers have started to be increasing, is that people are now, um, you know, getting used to this way, you know, taking evidence by commissioner, and the practice note is being is followed and considered. So my final question really is about timelines. So I mean, uh, it can often take, even in the, the speediest of circumstances, 18 months to two years for, for something to arrive at trial from the point of the crime, and that's if it's if it's sort of recent, not historic. So c can I ask? Um, how much earlier in that process this is going to enable that evidence to be taken, given that I think we all agree that essentially the sooner the better is by and large the, the rough rule of thumb, albeit given some, some caveats. Yeah, you and the bill also um, removes or uh, amends the current provisions by allowing um, a commission to happen prior to service of the indictment. Mm -hmm. The current legislation um, defines the commencement of a pre uh, proceedings by service of an indictment, so that has been amended. So it would be a commission could happen um, after an accused has appeared on petition, which is obviously some time before service of the indictment. That removes the legislative barrier because it had been highlighted to us as a reason, perhaps maybe why commissions don't happen earlier. Um, but we set out in the policy memorandum that in the, the short to medium term, we wouldn't expect a lot of commissions to happen pre-indictment because it's only at the point that the indictment is served that the accused knows all the charges that they're facing. Um, but again, I think it's, it's to remove that um, and to give a little bit more flexibility so that once these provisions do start to bed in and people get used to it, then there might be um, on a case-by-case -case basis where it would be appropriate um, to have a commission before service of an indictment, but that would really be a matter for um, you know, Crown Office and the defence, because obviously the defence still have the right to, to cross-examine. I mean, in practical terms, I mean, what, what does that mean? Are we talking about a few weeks earlier, a few months earlier, even a year before trial? I mean, what, 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 what is likely to happen on average in, in I mean, practical I, terms? I can certainly write the committee with maybe a better indication of timescales, but my understanding is that it could, somebody could be um, appearing on petition and it could be maybe six months, eight months later that the, the indictment served. Um, I think we do recognise that actually um, some cases are taking far too long, you know, from initial report to actually to get to getting to court. Um, so um, I don't... Yeah, the, this is, there's, the a, office. there's wider context to this as well, because obviously we're looking at the bill in pre-recording, but um, um, we're aware that in the summer, I think it was the Cabinet Secretary announced, um, I think it was 1.1 million funding, and that was to be used to help the Court Service and Crown Office reduce yeah. the amount of time in sexual assault cases that they take to go through the system. So in our policy memorandum, we've actually done a lot of the wider context as well, because this is in a sense of just one part of what needs to be done to actually look at it wider. So um, aware of a number of issues and actually all the various parts um, with the ministers and of the Justice Director are looking at different ways we can do that alongside Court Service and Crown Office rather than just pre-recording. Thank you. Thank you. John Finney, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> like there's been quite a number of references to the practice note. 
I wonder, can you say a bit more about that, please? Uh, is the author, Lady Dorian, is it a, what uh, regard the legislation has to that? And is it a, is it a, a dynamic thing? Is it a, an evolving piece of I think I can information? Sorry, sorry, I can yeah, speak sorry. to that because um, I sat on the group. It was one of the subgroups of the Evidence Procedure Review. Um, I was there as a government just observer because it actually had representatives from the legal sector, third sector. Uh, Lady Dorian chaired it. And there was a number of things, actually, off the back of the initial Evans and Procedure Review, looking at a bit more practical things, what can actually be done to enable greater pre-recording. So this was one work stream of that. As part of the work stream, um, Lady Doran obviously chaired it and was the, uh, in the court service the main people who actually developed the practice note. But it was done with inputs from all those sectors about how this could actually work. And it is quite a lengthy practice note. So it was almost about a year, I think it was, that that subgroup was actually looking at that before Lady Dorian brought in the practice uh, note, I think it was, was it um, May 2017. And it's, it's actually a high court that can actually bring in practice notes, so they do them regularly, so it could be updated at any time. Um, right now, this practice note is only for the high court. It'll be a matter for the, the court service whether they want to develop a similar one for the sheriff court. We understand at the moment, if there's commissions in the sheriff court, they do have cognizance of the actual high court practice note, but they don't have their, their own new one at the moment. So it could be amended at any time. In terms of this particular bill, we picked a few key elements for the grounds rule hearing of what we think potentially are things that should be in primary legislation. But in a sense, it's almost better to limit what's in primary legislation compared to the practice note for your very point, that it can be a fluid document and it's an easier thing to amend as they learn. And right now, the court service is actually evaluating the success of the pilot, uh, sorry, of the practice note. Um, you may be aware they very recently issued their first evaluation report, which is actually about how the guidance for the practice note is working in the High Court. And that um, got very positive feedback. And I think they're going to be doing a second evaluation report um, in the next few months, and I'm sure they'll be able to give further update on that. So they're evaluating it, and I'm sure there'll be lessons out of that they'll learn that might take further adaptions, but that would be for the court service probably to give more information on. So is this a nice to do or a have to do, or because it exists and uh, it's followed in any case? The High Court practice note. Yes. I think the High Court practice note is a, is a very important vehicle, actually, because it, say, it means that all the parties to the case, and not just the courts of judiciary, are actually aware of what's expected of them and give some form and guidance. The fact is already having a, it sounds like a very positive influence in the increase in numbers and also how prepared they are, I think shows that there is a lot of merit in it. So um, clearly it's a nice thing to do, but it sounds like it's having a very positive influence as well, so probably more than that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank okay, you. Liam Kerr. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, some of the submissions have raised concerns about miscarriages of justice being a possibility. Uh, so, Karen Ochenkloss, in your opening, you talked about this setting being less formal, uh, perhaps, but some might suggest that the process is taken less seriously. Uh, and also, for example, it doesn't allow the jury to see a contempor contemporaneous cross-examination. Uh, so, how reassured are you that miscarriages of justice will not happen? Um pretty much very reassured. Um, some people might think it's, it's less serious because it's in a less formal, but at the heart of this as well is actually um, protecting those that are most vulnerable. And by doing it in a less formal setting where they might feel slightly um, more relaxed, then we're likely to get better evidence for them. So in the interest of justice, I think that the best evidence we have can only be a good thing. It's also it's still under judicial scrutiny. And we must remember also these witnesses are often giving evidence on very traumatic matters. And what we might see as a more informal setting can still probably be a very intimidating setting for these witnesses. And, um, and commissions as they happen right now, they're informal in a sense, but they're not informal in the point that actually there's still legitimate questioning on quite difficult subjects that happens. In terms of your point about the jury not seeing it, as part of the Scottish Government's um, commissioning of jury research, there was actually an evidence review that we published in, I think it was in the last year, which was how pre-recording evidence is seen by jurors. And it was quite interesting in terms of how it's seen um, with respect to child's witnesses' evidence. And actually, there wasn't probably some of the things you might think about it not actually carrying the same weight or leading to any prejudices. It was actually quite positive in that respect. So um, I don't know if the committee has a link to, to that evidence review report, but if, do you, if not, we can certainly send it on to you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I thought that was... A, very interesting, some of the conclusions from that report. Um, but sticking with um, the pre-recording, I notice that there's an exception to the rule of pre-recording. Uh, if, and I'm 
pulling phrases out rather than giving you the full quote, but it, it says, if it gives rise to a significant risk of prejudice to the fairness of the trial, and that risk outweighs the prejudice to the child's interests, which I just thought was quite an interesting way of setting it, because it would suggest that the fairness of, the, to the, of prejudice to the child's interest outweighs the fairness of the trial. Uh, That's already actually set out in legislation and other matters to do with special measures, and it's, um, and it's been seen as it's still actually it's still accepted, because any decision that's actually taken on this, um, the right to fry trial, Article 6, that runs underneath all of it. Um, so, so that stays paramount, as it were, the well, fairness I mean, the of the trial. Things have, to, things have to always be convention compliant, even judges making decisions. But the actual wording that we use in our bill is actually wording that's currently used in the 1995 Act. It's not new wording. Mm -hmm. um, so it is seen as still as actually providing fairness to the trial. Um, I, we've sometimes had raised with us about the miscarriage of justice point, so it's a very, very point we're very sensitive mm -hmm. about. I think it, well, I can't say why people personally think it might be miscarriages. I think it might be a slight fear that in some way we're actually trying to remove the right of cross-examination or really greatly limit it or stop the proper testing. And we've really tried to make it quite clear that there's, we are absolutely not, that is not the policy intent. It's really just about having a more focused area of questioning in a more appropriate circumstance, but it's not in any way about legitimate questions not being put directly by the defence to the witness. That is still absolutely the intention. Mm -hmm. but you, presumably you would accept, though, that some of the criticisms have been, or mm -hmm. not criticisms, but that it does require a cultural shift, it, it, a mentality shift almost within the adversarial process that we have. I mean, I think that's right. It's kind of a movement to say just because you're actually um, maybe having a more trauma-informed way of how you're actually approaching children and vulnerable witnesses does not mean you're actually removing um, any of the rights to the accused to fair trial to actually test the evidence. By actually enabling the witness to get out their evidence, that actually doesn't undermine anybody else's fairness. All you're doing is let them actually have their story and then have legitimate questions. So we'll obviously always work with the legal sector whenever that's raised to try and alleviate those concerns because it's certainly not the intention at all. It's really just about being able to have maybe better circumstances where vulnerable children and witnesses can give their evidence but be properly tested at all times. And, and just sticking with that point, the Faculty of Advocates suggests that uh, there is a, a requirement that sufficient safeguards are in place, mm -hmm. so their words, sufficient mm -hmm. safeguards, uh, to ensure fairness. So what do you understand those sufficient safeguards to be and are you comfortable that they are in place? Um, I think I'd probably have to have the faculty here to say exactly what it is that they would have concerns with. It has been raised with us before in terms of the bill that they're slightly more concerned, and I'm sure they'll say this in evidence, that the way the bill's been drafted might actually mean that it's possible just for a prior statement to be submitted to court um, and not to actually have any form of cross-examination by a commissioner. I mean, we're quite clear, 100% that's not the policy intent. Um, the way the bill has just been drafted is just to explain the ways that pre-recording can happen. But, uh, but um, if the defence ever want to cross-examine, that is absolutely, that it have to be convention compliant, that can happen. However, what we've tried to allow for in the bill, which I think where maybe sometimes some concern has, been, has arisen, is there is actually a real possibility that a child's prior statement might be taken and the defence might not actually have any questions. And if that's the case, we don't want a commission just to have to be set up, to be, everybody to be sitting there and saying, actually, I've got no questions, and then send the child away. So we have to allow for some circumstance where the prior statement might be the only evidence. But if there's any questioning that's want to be done by the other party that's not called the witness, that will still happen. I do understand that. But the, just if I might pose the question again, because uh, the Faculty of Advocates have said there need to be sufficient safeguards in place. Now, presumably, you will have taken time to understand what those what what is a very powerful voice saying these need to be in place. You will have taken time to understand what those sufficient safeguards, in their view, would be, no, and if you think they're legitimate, to build them into the legislation. I mean, is that absolutely. Right? I've had a, a number of meetings with the faculty of advocates, and I have to say they've actually been very helpful and mm -hmm. very supportive of the representatives we've met in that respect. I mean, I think one of the key safeguards is the fact that all of this is done is under judicial scrutiny. Everything that's set up in terms of the grounds rule hearing the commission is always done under judicial scrutiny. So the judge is always there is the, you know, the, to ensure that actually a fair trial can take place. And I think that's one of the main safeguards. We're not removing that in any way or any sense. So obviously it's still the same thing to make sure actually that nothing further goes. In terms of safeguards, obviously if there's anything further that we haven't thought of, we'll listen to the fact as evidence and absolutely we will take that on, on board. As I say, they've been very constructive in their dealings with us and we'll carry on so. 
Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I hear what the Faculty of Advocates are, are saying, and they've been very constructive, but it actually sounds like this bill is, at its essence, providing a safeguard for the court process by changing the environment in which vulnerable witnesses give evidence. I just wonder if you'd agree with that. I think, as I touched on earlier, um, you know, the hope is that actually it's not just about somebody giving evidence, but it's about somebody giving their best evidence. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the provisions in the bill um, have always had that in mind. It's not just about getting evidence, but it's about securing the best evidence from the child or the vulnerable witness. And thereby safeguarding the court yeah. process. Yeah. Okay, Rona, thanks, thanks. Thank you, Convener. Yeah, I just wanted to um, briefly again just to ask your opinion on the Barnahus model um, and whether you think this bill would bring us any closer to that. Um, probably the first thing to say is the, the bill is not Barnahus. Mm -hmm. It absolutely is not Barnahus. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually had some involvement previously with the, the Barnahus concept, and that's probably the main thing I would say about Barnahus, is it actually is a general concept. Mm -hmm. um, it's often talked about the Barnhouse model, but as it's slowly been rolled out in different parts of Europe, they all adapt it according to the circumstances of each individual country, what, what works best for it. And um, I've actually had some formal um, initial dealings with Barnhouse before it, it moved to another unit. And when I went over to, as part of the EU Promise Programme, I don't know if you've, you've heard of that or not, but it was, um, it was an EU-funded uh, programme which brought representatives from lots of different countries to actually find out about Barnhouse, some who were actually setting it up, some who were just only considering it. So initially it was court service and children first who went. I went to the very last meeting of it and actually one thing that did strike me when I went to it is I think I was about the only justice representative there, I think it was another police officer. A lot of people came from health and child protection because a lot of what Barnhouse is about is actually the, the sort of trauma-informed child focus. So it's a lot about the health and child protection. I actually, when I was over at that meeting, spent a bit of time talking to um, one of the main people who's actually been responsible for actually bringing into Barnhus into Europe. He's, um, he's a gentleman called Bragi Gubranson. He was the uh, Director General of um, the Child Protection Agency in Iceland. I think he's now actually finished that job because he's now moved on to being a committee member for the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. So I spoke a little bit about him because obviously I was coming from it, looking at it from a justice point of view. And he was clear as well, what Barnhouse could work in the adversarial system, most systems have set it up are inquisitorial. Um, there would be no problem with the Barnhouse, but you would have to put adapting it to an adversarial system, which means you wouldn't tend to have the one bit of Barnhouse, the one forensic model interview. Um, you could still have RA bits of pre-recording, because actually what Barnhouse is, it's much more about wraparound services, forensic medical examination, um, therapy, advocacy, that all happening in one place. So, so currently the, the Scottish Government is just exploring the Barnhouse concept and whether it potentially could be adapted mm. um, for Scotland. So that's very much at the exploration stage, but that work is under, being undergoing at the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, you, you haven't mentioned the streamlined process um, for arranging the use of standard special measures. Um, the bill provides for an automatic entitlement and uh, making it administrative rather than judicial. Could you perhaps talk around that? Yeah, I mean, the way the, the legislation is framed at the moment, actually, if somebody is automatically entitled to standard special measures, then they're automatically entitled. Um, but the way the legislation was framed, um, the um, applications of the notice were going to the judge. So really, this is actually just to free up judicial time and to make it more an administrative process, because uh, other, the, the other thing with standard special measures are automatically entitled to them, and nobody, um, other parties, can can object. So it really is to make it more an administrative rather than a, a judicial rubber stamping exercise to free up time. And there's, there's no concern that by making it an automatic process that it's admitted and administrated and the judge just casting his eye over um, who's, this, who, who's before them, that someone might slip through the net that might need not just the standard but perhaps other uh, um, measures? The legislation um, is framed at the moment as well does have review provisions so that a, you know, a court or a judge could review if they didn't think that the most appropriate special measure had been applied for. Um, so, and the new rule obviously has review provisions built in as well. Right. And Liam Kerr, supplementary. Thanks, Convener. Uh, something perhaps slightly separate. The SCTS Evidence and Procedure Review. I uh, referred to research which indicated that the current system of examination and cross-examination is not a good way of obtaining accurate evidence from a vulnerable witness. Uh, 
now, through our papers, that's referred to several times, and I find that very interesting. So I'm just wondering, can you give us a bit more detail on what that uh, evidence says? And first of all, is that research scalable uh, to not only other vulnerable witnesses, but in fact the whole system as it stands at the moment? Yes, in terms of procedure view, it was looking at as whether the adversarial system, it was, it's probably a much bigger picture than that. And um, I mentioned earlier, um, I think it was related to Mr. Perfini's questions about the subgroup on joint investigative interviews and also Lady Dorian's. Part of that was looking at maybe a longer term vision that could be done. And that was almost potentially moving a bit from that system to more, in one case, is having the one forensic interview. Um, I think that was level one, so it was only for certain child witnesses. That was seen as very much a long term vision. Um, I think it's safe to say, and obviously Lady Dorian and Court Service can speak for themselves, but that's not something that could be done quickly. In a sense, what's being proposed by the Scottish Government at the moment is potentially a first step. It's a first step to getting the whole system used to pre-recording as more of a norm, which just doesn't happen at the moment. Um, whether we currently have the best system or not is probably beyond what we can comment on. But it was actually interesting to look at in terms of actually getting to the truth and how to find out about it. There was a lot of interesting things that came out of the evidence procedure review. But really it was about starting. It's a bit of a, we always talk about a journey, whether it ends up in that end point or not of actually moving to more of an inquisitorial system. We're just at the very start of the journey where we're not really used to pre-recording and evidence being taken in advance in Scotland. And it's actually just starting that and that becoming more of the norm. Um, in terms of research and everything, I probably would leave it to court service to be much more involved in it, to comment on it in detail in case I misrepresent it. But, mm -hmm. um, but I think it was part of just a, a much more extensive vision, possibly for the future for Scotland, rather than, than anything that immediately could happen. But if that is the start of a journey, how would you respond to the criticisms, perhaps too strong, but the suggestion that the ability to extend the category vulnerable witnesses by regulation only gives Parliament insufficient scrutiny over that category going forward? I mean, the, the, the provision to extension is, I think, it's proposed by affirmative procedure. Uh -huh. So we still have a lot of, I think it would still have actually significant scrutiny. It's hard to see how, what other way it could be done. I mean, clearly, if the, the committee or the Parliament weren't happy with what's being proposed, then um, further evidence could be given. In terms of actually any extension, I suspect this would have to be happen. It wouldn't just be done in a vacuum. There'd have to be lots of discussions about it and how it would be done and actually to have um, broad discussion. The one thing that I think why it's good to have that flexibility, but still to absolutely have the parliamentary scrutiny by being by affirmative procedure, is if you have anything too flexible, there's a much greater risk that actually things come in before actually the system is ready for it to be handled, and that could have a really detrimental effect on vulnerable witnesses themselves. So there is absolutely going to be parliamentary scrutiny if in the future regulations are brought forward to extend it to deemed vulnerable witnesses. As I say there's the parliamentary scrutiny built in. It's not that it would just be done by a commencement order. For that power, it would have to be actually put before the parliament. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our questioning. Can I thank the witnesses very much for attending. We'll now suspend briefly to allow a change of witnesses and a five minute gun for break.
Agenda item two is an evidence session on the management of Offenders Scotland Bill. I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk, and paper four, which is a private paper. And I welcome Jill Emery, HM Chief Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland, HN the Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland twice. <laughs> Wendy Sinclair, G. G. Gibbon. 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 Given. Thank you. Uh, HM Chief Inspector of um, Prisons for Scotland and Chief Inspector Gary McEwen, Divisional Commander, Criminal Justice Service Division, Police Scotland, and Colin McConnell, Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service. Can I thank all the witnesses for your written submissions? As always, the, the committee find these particularly valuable in advance of our formal evidence session. So, um, can I? Well, actually, we're not too bad for time. Um, I think we, we can um, allow a bit of magnitude, but if we could be as succinct as possible and maybe direct um, direct questions, maybe not to the whole panel, but if you've got a question, you know exactly who to direct it to, that would be a more effective session. So, um, can we start with the questionings and Liam MacArthur. Good morning. It set out in your, your written evidence, as the community said, which was very helpful, but um, just for the record, it might be helpful just to start with a question around uh, home detention curfew and, and, and who can be released under home detention curfew, how the balance is struck uh, in terms of, of public protection and, and, and obviously the process of, of rehabilitation. Who wants to... Yeah, probably Mr McConnell. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr MacArthur. Um, well, as you, as you know, the, um, you know, the Chief Inspector of Prisons uh, and uh, Chief Inspector of Constabulary made a number of uh, recommendations that were considered by, by the Scottish Government, out of which uh, has um, emerged and developed uh, a further set of restrictions in terms of uh, those in custody that can be considered uh, for home detention curfew. And I mean, I have the list here, which I'm happy to, to read out. So there are the, the statutory exclusions. So that's those required to uh, register as a sex offender, uh, anyone on an extended uh, sentence, uh, those who have a supervised release order, those currently serving a Section 17 or 18 recall, uh, those subject to hospital direction, or of course, those awaiting deportation. Over and above that, um, there is a presumption against grant of HDC uh, for those uh, whose index offence is involved in an act of violence, uh, where the index offence uh, involved the possession or use of an offensive weapon, where the index offence involved the possession or use of an article which has a blade or a sharp point, uh, or, and in, to include, uh, those who have any uh, links to serious and organised uh, crime. So, in terms of the situation now, um, there is a, a considerable uh, restriction and presumption against uh, the grant of HDC, which has resulted in, uh, since these new measures uh, were introduced, uh, approaching a 75% reduction in the grant of, of HDC. So where at one time we may well have been uh, somewhere between, say, 25 and 30 uh, grants of HDC uh, per week. Uh, we are now down to seven. And I mean, you've described those that are I excluded. I mean, what previously was the um, uh, the assumption around HDC? Would you got to a certain point in your in, in, in your term, and 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 you could automatically a a apply for that, or yeah. you would be put forward for it? So, in a sense, there are, there are um, two facets to this. The first is that the statutory exclusions, of course. Uh, always applied. I think previously the presumption would have been, unless there were particular factors, the anticipation would have been to grant uh, HDC, so that has uh, completely been turned around. The presumption now is not uh, to grant HDC, where there are uh, any concerns at all. And of course now the introduction of uh, previous acts of, uh, of violence. And although the presumption against uh, guides towards the index offence, decision makers are encouraged to look further uh, into uh, someone's background. Um, and I, th I think the implication of that is clearly where any recent indication of violence or e even any uh, con 
act of violence that's considered to be serious that might well be some time in the past would probably mitigate towards uh, the decision that would be against grant of HDC. I mean, that's a, a fairly <clears throat> dramatic fall that you've described there, and, and uh, 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 at one level, uh, I think it's entirely understandable how we've arrived at that point. But presumably, given the, the purpose um, of, of HDC was um, a, about rehabilitation of those um, about to leave prison back into the community. So presumably, that dramatic re reduction in the numbers getting HDCs is, is, is going to have a knock-on impact on that rehabilitation process. Um, and, and if that's the case, what measures can be taken to, to try and address that? Because <coughs> clearly it's not in anybody's interest to, mm -hmm. uh, to see offenders being released um, back into the community um, and, and, and going through that circle of reoffending again. Yeah. Absolutely valid point. I mean, it's, at the end of the day, it's the same group of people mm -hmm. um, who are, are being considered, or uh, in a sense, with because of the, the nature of the people that we care for in, in Scottish prisons, you know, the, the, the background for most of them is, is, is fairly similar. So you know, what we're, we're seeing here um, is something I imagine will be projected in the weeks and months and years, uh, years ahead. But essentially, um, you know, we can't have it always. If our um, concern is, and understandably so, the potential uh, for someone to commit um, a further offence or, in fact, a heinous act uh, when on any form of licence, then it's quite understandable that if the tolerance uh, of that is reduced, um, even the tolerance of that as a potential uh, is reduced, then clearly our, our position is, is to move forward on this, this sort of basis. Now, I, I have to be clear with the committee. I mean, my, my instruction to, uh, through the operations director to governors is that we should be very, very careful uh, in terms of how we arrive at those decisions to grant HDC, uh, given what has happened, but also given the level of political and public concern that there's been mm -hmm. um, quite recently in terms of um, people being released into the community. So I think we're seeing here a, a very a clear change in behaviours which I think will be sustained over time. I, I, I'm going to come to that issue around the, the, the information that inf informs those decisions and, and the, 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 the training that's applied to those making the decisions. I just wonder whether Mr McEwen or any other panellists want to address that point about um, the, the rehabilitation process and, and, and any concerns that might arise out of um, the, the, the approach that's now being taken. I'd be happy to add to that, Mr MacArthur, just in terms of the um, involvement of other agencies in the assessment of an individual's behaviour in the community. That was something that we certainly saw was missing, that other than the, the service provider actually having um, the control of the, the device to control uh, the curfew to, to manage that. There was no other assessment of conditions for that individual. Um, I think the <coughs> principles that were in place for home detention curfew previously were sound in that the three guiding principles for the prison service were about protecting the public, about preventing reoffending, and about successful reintegration into the community. It was the fact that certainly the evidence we managed to find in our review uh, showed that that wasn't happening was the problem, not the principles in themselves. Yeah, although the, the statutory um, exclusions that Mr McConnell has just talked about, in a sense, take the, the, the decisions that need to be taken down to a much, a much smaller level. I mean, is that, as well as in involving others, it would be helpful to, to, to know now precisely who is expected to be involved in that decision-making process. But the, 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 the training that's provided for, for those individuals, the, the, the information and the evidence they're able to draw upon in order to inform those decisions, how's that, what has that been like up until now and how is that going to change as a result of, of the reports that have been, have, have been produced? From, um, from SPS's perspective, I mean, we welcome uh, the reports that have been uh, published. As, as the committee knows, we've, we've accepted uh, without uh, limitation the, uh, the recommendations for improvement that, that have been uh, made. In terms of the decision-making process, again, as, as I expect the committee knows uh, by now, 
um, the governor in charge of the respective prison takes the, the final uh, decision. Um, and as before, and there's a sort of multiplexity of contributions uh, to that, that, uh, that eventual decision, both from within and out with um, the prison environment. That remains uh, the case. Uh, of course, the, the engagement with external uh, contributors uh, has been um, focused on in, in greater measure now uh, to make sure that um, you know, the bases are appropriately covered. And this is about defensible decision-making uh, at the end of the day. I mean, I think the key advantage that we have now is that we have fewer people in terms of within the Scottish Prison Service, we have fewer people engaged in the decision-making process. These people are clearly identified and the roles are very specific. Uh, and having governors, or in their absence, uh, deputy governors uh, taking those crucial decisions, again, is a, a strengthening, uh, given the recommendations that were made, because these are strategic decision makers, and that's all part of their experience and training as they move on uh, through, uh, through the service. What, again, what that um, introduces is a, an opportunity for reflective practice uh, in the Scottish Prison Service. So governors in charge meet every month with the Director of Operations, and part of that process is reflective practice through which this decision-making process will be continuously reviewed and improved upon. So we'll get that consistency uh, across the service that the Chief but, Inspector... But from what you're saying, that will still be the, the decision of a governor or a deputy governor. It's not moving to a situation where... Um, effectively, a, a, a board of individuals oh, no. um, would, no, be, no. would be taking that, that decision. Yeah. yeah. So, so previously, it would have been at sort of middle manager uh, level in the service, those decisions. Now it's the governor in charge of each of the prisons that, that makes those final decisions. Uh, of course, some uh, may wish to, to appeal against that, and there is an appeal process. Um, but it's governors in charge who take those decisions. If they are not available, it's their deputy. And if others, you were talking about the, the multiplicity of views that would be taken on board by the governor or deputy governor before yeah. arriving at that decision, if, if any were to, to, to raise serious concerns about um, what the governor or deputy governor was intending to do, uh, would, that, would that be overridden? Would that be construed as a, a potential veto? Would, in, in a sense, what, uh, is the, the, the idea to arrive at some kind of unanimity across the, the, mm -hmm. the range of stakeholders? Well, we do... You know, to be clear, you know, governors in charge are, are experienced strategic decision makers. It's the nature of, of their job. Uh, so we trust governors to act appropriately within the framework that they've been uh, given. And the instructions are clear. And I want to reiterate with the committee, uh, given where we're at now, the presumption is against the grant of HDC. Uh, so governors will identify uh, those who more clearly will benefit from HDC in the absence of clear or critical uh, concerns. So again, as I've been able to set out for you uh, in the statistics that I've uh, uh, shared with you, you know, a, a towards 75% reduction would suggest, certainly in the short term, uh, that those uh, critical decisions are probably more appropriately being taken given the limitations that, that we now, now have and that governor practice is reviewed on a regular basis. And just in terms of the additional information that's been Provided you've talked about the, the other individuals or, mm -hmm. or stakeholders that be involved, is, is there additional types of information mm -hmm. or evidence that will be sought as part of that decision-making process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, that was that was part of the recommendation that was uh, was made overall. So, um, you know, police colleagues might might wish to contribute. Mm -hmm. But both practically and, and currently, um, there's a considerable amount of work going on, particularly with, with Police Scotland, in terms of information uh, sharing and making sure that that information runs through into the decisions that are, are taken. There's an exchange of information every Monday morning um, in terms of the data bank that we have for those that are being considered uh, for HDC, and that information is subsequently validated. So, in terms of the information that's coming together from criminal justice social work, from uh, Police Scotland, from across uh, the prison service, in terms of that data that we know, the information that we hold on each individual who's being considered, um, I mean, it's, it's a quantum leap forward uh, in that sense. And again, I'm going to reiterate, I think having a strategic decision maker sitting on top of that 
gives us uh, a, a far better level of assurance than we had previously. Mr. McKeon, yeah. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I certainly support all that's been said there. That you know the purpose of home detention curfews is absolutely the reintegration of the right people back into into communities and and that uh, aspect of rehabilitation. The role of the police in all of this is where where a home detention curfew has been breached is to then understand what the breach is, whether that be a breach of curfew or committing an offence, and then for the police to to basically try and, and incarcerate that individual and for that individual to then be recalled back to the to the prison. So the premise of HDCs I fully support and you know the risk assessment now, the communication between both organisations is far better than it was previously. As as Colin and mentioned there, there is now weekly uh, discussions, conference calls if you like at that operational level where they have regular discussions to ensure that those at the prison service are releasing on home detention curfew and importantly those that have breached their curfew or the, the any aspect of that then that is communicated to Police Scotland and then we can action that very quickly at the local level with good oversight by local commanders now and local area commanders to actually make sure these individuals that, that are unlawfully at large are brought into custody as soon as we can possibly make it. Yeah, colleagues, I'll come on to the, the issues around breach. I'll just finish on, on, on one point. Uh, Mr McConnell, you've described, as I say, a dramatic reduction in use of HDC. Mr uh, McEwen, you've talked about um, now in a, 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 an appropriate level and, and, and managed around risk. I mean, that does tend to suggest that where we were before was a situation that nobody can have been entirely comfortable with. Um, I, I, obviously, we've, we've arrived at this situation through the most tragic of circumstances, but were concerns being raised previously at the extent to which HDCs were being used across the board for, for, for individuals that, that really should not have been um, being granted HDCs? Yeah, perhaps I could uh, I could take the lead on that. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I follow the logic um, uh, there, Mr. MacArthur. I, I, I can understand if you're juxtaposing the current position uh, almost on a monochrome basis with with where we were previously. The fact is, the approach has changed. So, um, as the Chief Inspector reported, um, you know the particular instance that that led to the review, actually SPS had complied with the instructions, the guidance, as it was at, at the time. But this, this guidance is of, of a different order. We have moved from a presumption for to a presumption against. So it shouldn't surprise us then that with the restrictions that we put in place and with um, potentially uh, more adept decision makers uh, now taking those critical decisions, that we've seen a change, uh, a sea change, I, I think, in the level of grant of, of HDC. I, I wouldn't uh, agree, as I say, with a monochrome position that what went before uh, was not acceptable. What went before was compliant with the rules and regulations as they were, the rules and regulations as we have now, and the import of um, a presumption against rather than a presumption for. I think leads us to the, the, the conclusions that we're drawing now. Well, I don't think it's a monochrome characterisation. I think it, it, it's simply picking up the, the, the point that, that you've made about the dramatic reduction where the, the, the presumption is now shifted mm -hmm. and a suggestion that this manages risk in a way that is, uh, is entirely appropriate. I don't doubt that that's the case, but I think the public would question why, mm -hmm. if previously the HDCs were being used to the extent they were, albeit for rehabilitative purposes mm -hmm. and, all the, uh, 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 and all the rest of it. Um, that, that somehow there weren't concerns being raised at that stage as to whether or not that was appropriate, that the prom presumption was where it needed to be, that mm -hmm. the statutory um, exclusions were as extensive as they, uh, as they needed to be. And, yeah. and, and as, as I say, I think that's an entirely legitimate question for, the, mm. for ourselves and yes. indeed the wider public to be asking. Yeah. And uh, if, if, if I may um, just, just come back to that, I, you know, I agree entirely um, and goes back to <coughs> I think an element of, of your earlier question, which is, you know, at the end of the day, what is HDC for? You know, if we are, um, you know, a society that believes in testing people out in the community, people who have made mistakes and fallen by the wayside, um, and that we should find opportunities to, in, in a sense, 
retest and give people the opportunity to survive in that test and not, not make mistakes. Um, then that's, that's the fundamental that lies behind HDC and licensing more generally. Um, th there's been a couple of uh, horrendous um, experiences uh, in, in people in the community who have either been on HDC or, or, on, or on license. And that's caused us collectively to reflect on that, which has led us to the position we're in now. Uh, I wonder if Ms. Uh, Ms. Sinclair Jeevan has anything to, to add. Uh, one of the things that we were pleased about was that all of the recommendations have been accepted. But the thing that I've been particularly pleased about is the speed of acceptance. So I know that the guidance document, which after all is the Bible for people who are deciding on HDC, is something they lean on. And when I look at the new guidance document that's already been issued, you know, it, it holds all the extra stuff that you've put in. And funny enough, we didn't actually recommend. Um, but it's gone into all the details. All the recommendations we've put are now in there. And it's a much clearer, more robust document. And it also adds consistent documentation to it. And one of our concerns was consistency of judgment. You know, when it comes to the day the judgment happens between one person, we asked for a secondary assurance with someone more senior, that now happens, and the guidance document is considerably larger, provides the documentation with it. We should see a consistency of approach. The, the statutory exclusions are now much, much bigger, or not the statutory exclusions, the exclusions are now much, much greater. And, and listening to that debate, my feeling is it's the exclusions that are causing that drop rather than the poverty of the capability beforehand. Yeah. I wonder if you have any um, thoughts about the impact of, of these more stringent restrictions on the prison population? I have. Funnily enough, we were speaking about that before. I had real concerns before this review started that there might be unintended consequences of a rise in the prison population, and not just from HDC. One of the things that I had asked for in my recommendations is that there is an official and an independent evaluation of the whole HDC, that we collect the reconviction statistics, that we actually look at whether HDC does work for reintegration. My concern is that if we become risk averse on HDC, we will also become risk averse on parole, people going to the open estate, which means the pressure on the prisons, that some of which are already struggling, is going to become huge. And I really worried about that ahead of time. And Colin and I keep in regular touch because I wanted to see how the population was growing. One of the other intent, unintended consequences, which you all know, is that the pressure on the population also puts pressure on the staff and also puts pressure on all sorts of other things. You know, the level of self-harm goes up, the level of um, violence can go up. So I think it's a very testing time at the moment because we've got that distinct evidence that this change to the HDC has had an impact. And I, I was interested that you said that you know, does this imply that previously that meant that we weren't getting it right? I think we need a further review in a further three or five years' time that says, have we got this right? You know, is this having the consequences we wanted for HDC? You know, we need to do that proper evaluation. All right. Supplementary, Liam, um, Care. Thank you, convener. Uh, just to pick up that point, but it's really something Colin McConnell responded to Liam MacArthur about the, the uh, political and public tolerance of risk. Uh, because what I'm hearing from you is that uh, since the reviews and since some tragic incidents have happened, that politically and publicly there is a reduced tolerance for, for risk uh, of reoffending. Uh, so the question begged is who, who is making the assessment that we could have a higher tolerance of risk to public health? Was that the SPS or was that an instruction from government? That's uh, an extraordinarily difficult question to answer because you know, I listen to the discussions in the Scottish Parliament. I take into account um, discourse in the media. I have um, some 
discussions with, with parliamentarians on a one-to-one a, a -one, uh, basis, uh, as well as taking general counsel from, um, from other professionals uh, uh, across uh, the justice system. So I, I don't think uh, it's as straightforward as, as either or. I think it's a melange of, of, of all of that. And certainly I think part of my role as CEO of the service is to try and set the tone of what I think sensible decision-making in uh, an operational public service is. And my judgment at the moment is, um, given all that uh, discourse that has been going on, uh, that there is a lower level of tolerance, uh, particularly in the public domain, and I'd be interested to hear from parliamentarians uh, sitting around here if you don't think that's the case. Um, but certainly my own judgment is, and I influence my, my decision makers in the organisation, is that we uh, need to be more cautious uh, in terms of our decision making, particularly around allowing people access uh, to the community when they are on uh, a prison sentence. And I think the, the guidance and the restrictions that have been agreed and implemented reflect that. Begin by asking Mr. McConnell, what number of crimes have been committed over the last two to three years, whatever numbers you have, by people on home detention curfew, especially serious, violent, and sexual crimes? Uh, I don't have that data immediately at hand. Interestingly, I, I thought that's something the committee would be, be interested in and asked uh, my team for that this morning. So we're working up uh, those details. I think I can say um, that. You know, other than those that are already in, in the public domain, which have, which have influenced this, uh, this review. Um, I'm not aware of um, high numbers of serious offending. Uh, but there will be um, you know, a low level of, of offending, of course, and that reflects those who, um, that's reflected in numbers whose licenses or HDCs have been uh, breached. Um, but I don't have that particular number, but I'm happy, looking at the convener here, I'm happy to write to the committee if, if that would be helpful with those numbers. Absolutely, very helpful. Yes. I mean, the numbers that have been intimated to me are 16 murders and dozens of serious sexual assaults. Um, would those numbers surprise you? I mean, I mean that, that's what's been intimated to me. Uh, I would be entirely unfamiliar with those numbers. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll await your clarification because obviously I mean I think the key thing here and, and, and based on your, your, your previous answers is a question of whether or not the tragic uh, 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 circumstances which brought these reviews about are mm -hmm. isolated mm -hmm. uh, and to what extent actually the, the, there was a, 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 a wider problem. Would, would you agree with, with that? With, with the convener's indulgence if I could just uh, check Mr Johnson that your information would lead you to believe that for people on HDC, there have been 16 murders? That, 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 that is a point, uh, or a number that was raised with me directly uh, by um, the, 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 the family of the, the person who lost I, their life as a result of the McClellan family. Of course, I, I will check. I mean, I'm shocked and stunned by that number, and I'm in, entirely not familiar with any... any well, I mean, I, in all, I, mean I, I just... Obviously, you're, you've asked for those numbers. I think it's an important one for the the point I just raised there. I, just, I mean, I'm just looking at police colleagues to... Yeah, uh, I have to say I'd be very surprised if there were 16 murders since 2006 with those that have been out on home detention curfew. I'd be extremely surprised if that was accurate, but it would be interesting to get the figures. I mean, are you confident about the, the, the processes that are in place? I mean, you, you're saying that it's now the governor that would be taking the final decision. I'd really like to ask the question why it wasn't the governor taking those decisions previously and, and actually who was can you just give us some clarification as to what kind of level of seniority what kind of number of years of experience mm -hmm. that the individual uh, taking those decisions yeah. was having and, and was it finally signed off by the governor and actually what will prevent essentially that this becoming just a rubber stamp process given the new guidelines uh, that, that, that have been that are being brought in. Mm, yeah. uh, so as I've already said previously, it would be uh, one identified uh, middle manager uh, in the prison who would uh, take uh, those decisions previously. Uh, now it's, it has to be um, the governor in charge. Uh, you know, effectively, it signs those decisions off. Um, previously, 
again, just reflecting on on that data you've just shared with me, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a bit stunned by that that it, suggestion. It was referred to directly, personally, and anecdotally. Okay. And, and I'm, I'm, I mean, in a sense, you know, my primary concern is, the, the, you know, that this family feel that they have an awful lot of questions and are still very angry. And I, in some ways, want to put the questions to you that they would if they were here, yeah. because I think that's actually so, quite important. Um, in terms of the previous decision-making process, I mean, the. The information that's already been shared uh, with, with Parliament is that 80% of people on uh, HDC completed their, um, their licence without, without issue. There's a level beyond that where there were technical uh, breaches. Um, but of course there were, there were those, uh, and I'll get that data for you, a comparatively small number who went on to um, commit further offences, but generally uh, those offences were low level. That's not me excusing it or diminishing it. That's just the fact. Um, and we know, of course, because it is a fact, uh, that uh, in recent times there has been, uh, as far as HDC is, is concerned, one very serious issue, um, which we should all reflect upon uh, carefully, and in which we would hope um, the measures that we put in place uh, are designed um, to make as unlikely as as, as possibly uh, we can. But I'm going to go back to, um, if I may, the, the similarity in, in the questions between yourself, Mr Johnson, and, and, and those raised by, by Mr MacArthur. I, do, I don't think uh, it's, it's right or appropriate um, to try and make the position that because we have put in place deci different decision-making processes now because of what's happened, that that is in any way, given the instructions that we had in place, a criticism of decision makers uh, previously. It's it's not, and I think well, as a chief it, inspector, it, with has, all due has, respect, Mr. McCollum, if I you know, quote directly from the HMIPS report, you know, whilst an assessment process clearly existed, it may not be regarded by some to meet the definition of robust. This situation, and I've skipped a sentence, but this situation led to different criteria, interpretation or timescales being adopted in different establishments. That's a, that's a pretty critical thing to be put into a report. And while I agree with you, because we've adopted new criteria and, and assessment processes, that does not necessarily infer anything about the previous one. This, that, those sentences in this report do, and I think they do question the robustness of, of your processes. And I think if this ultimately of what we're about is, as Jill Imry uh, pointed out, that, that one of the fundamental criteria is about keeping the public safe, questioning the robustness of your processes there, I think, is, is of serious concern. I was just wondering how you'd respond to and that. I, and I think, uh, and I'm grateful for that clarification, because what the Chief Inspector also said was that in the case that was being referred to specifically, uh, that actually the decision makers had followed uh, the process. And I think that is quite insightful, that generally, um, you know, the view is, uh, or was, and the Chief Inspector may wish to comment on this, was the, um, the guidance, the rules that were in place were by and large being, being followed. I think where we are now, and I think we welcome uh, the report and the recommendations, is moving from a situation where the presumption was to grant HDC, the presumption now not to grant HDC by its very necessity brings with it a far tighter uh, set of requirements. And I think that's what we've put in place. And I think that's what the Chief Inspector is saying. Can, can I just ask one final question? I mean, the, 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 the situation regarding home detention curfew in, in many ways is comparable to the decision at the beginning of the, the custodial sentence of the criminal justice process with regard to remand and, and whether or not to, to bail. Um, I was just wondering whether or not that decision gets taken into consideration either now or, or in the previous uh, processes that you undertook, i.e. whether or not a, a, a sheriff or a judge had bailed the person and whether or not they had, had uh, concerns about public safety. And if you don't, would that be worth, and would it be worth you having, or would you find that information valuable as part of your considerations going forward? So that's, that's an interesting proposition. Uh, no, we don't take, take that in, into account. Um, in, in, in that, uh, the person that we have for, uh, before us, making, in terms of who we're making decisions for, is someone who, who has been convicted and sentenced to, to a period of, of custody. So 
Our, our concern in that sense is that that aspect of the judicial process has already been followed through. We then have an executive or administrative process which, which we apply. But I, I, can, I can understand the principle that, that you're making, and it's certainly something I would be happy um, with Justice Policy colleagues to reflect on. Thank you. John Finney, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Convener. It's, it's a question for Mr McConnell. I'm afraid you're getting them all, Mr McConnell. Um, public safety is paramount, and I think if we park that, I mean, everyone accepts that. Can I ask, and can I commend the rehabilitative work the Scottish Police Service do? I think it's absolutely vital to, to my mind. That's what, what it should all be about. Can I ask about a particular category of prisoner? A sizable percentage of the prison population uh, are people with addiction issues, be that drugs and alcohol. I wouldn't want a situation where there isn't a realisation that these illnesses have with them lapsing as part of it. Can you see the regard that there would be to these, these circumstances in decisions around home detention curfew, please? I mean, we, would in, in, we would entirely hope that um, you know, someone who is granted HDC would continue with any therapeutic process that's going on um, whilst in custody. But of course, we can't insist on that. Uh, that becomes ultimately a matter of, of choice. That's linked to um, the provision of other services in the community, because HDC is only in, in the main granted to people who are serving less than four years. Uh, so there's no statutory provision for them in, in the community. There is a voluntary uh, provision, which they can decide to access uh, or not. But certainly, as we engage with people moving through that process, and as we go through the transition back to the community, um, all of us, be it agencies based in the community or, in fact, ourselves based uh, in the custodial environment, really do try to encourage people to engage as productively as possible with all the services that, that may help them resettle appropriately. But, but for instance, would it be established that there would be a service available so for, for someone to engage with? Would Almost that be a factor? Yes. OK. Thank you, that's reassuring. Shona, oh, sorry, oh, yes, sorry. by all means. One of the things that has changed in the guidance is that before they would attach licence conditions with no guarantee that the criminal justice social work would be able to monitor or support those mm -hmm. licence conditions. Now they have to have the guarantee in place or the written acceptance and agreement before HDC can be granted. So there is a shift in that direction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's reassuring. Um, Shona. We've, we've touched on some of this already in terms of the presumption against release on HDC. So I want to focus a little bit more on the, the um, anticipation that you might have of, of whether the extension of presumption against release um, to offences involving violence, possession of a weapon or links to serious organised crime. Would the panel anticipate, therefore, that the already quite dramatic fall in numbers of, I think, 75% was said, do you see a further fall happening in the light of the extension of presumption against? And also, I was particularly interested in Wendy sinclair Gibbons' um, comment about the need for an independent evaluation, maybe three to five years down the line of HDC. Um, would you anticipate that being focused on the changes that have happened, um, which are quite dramatic? And I take it from what you said, you'd be particularly interested in whether that has had an impact on the prison population, but presumably also what the outcomes have been uh, for those who have been granted HDC. So it would be interesting just to hear a little bit more about it, but if it's maybe on the numbers, first of all, whether you think there'll be a further drop? Um, uh, I, that's, that's, that's really a, a hard one to answer. As, as I've already said to the committee, um, you know, the population isn't going to change that much in terms of what people bring with them as their, as their back stories. So I think we're seeing the outworkings of um, you know, the back stories of most people who make their way into custody. And I, I would be concerned that, um, you know, depending on how far back we think something is um, reasonable to consider, mm -hmm. most people who head our way at some stage will have engaged in violence some way and, and somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so will the numbers uh, remain the same? I, I, I think they will, they will stabilise uh, over time. I 
doubt whether we are going to see them shift much up the way. Um, so if we are, move, we've moved from a position of somewhere between 25 and 30 grants per week to now somewhere around seven. Mm. Um, do, I, do I see that going up to 10, 12, 15? Probably not. Uh, so I, I, I think it's going to be at the lower end over time because, as I say, the population in custody, generally speaking, has a, has a back story. And it, for most people, that will involve some level of violence somewhere. So, so how, just further on that, how much discretion, therefore, will there be um, on the issue of where an offence involves violence? Because, as you said, that's a very broad... Um, well, it could cover many, many uh, offenders. Uh, so, just so I understand the process then of the presumption against, will that ultimately come down to the judgment of the governor in terms of how far back, or, or uh, in terms of the guidance, how clear is that in relation to? And, and uh, again, I think that's that's a really, really important and a issue, and I think strategic for the justice system. So. You know, my guidance to governors, let's be clear about this, is to be cautious mm -hmm. and to take a broad look at someone's offending history. And I think if there's any indication, that certainly if anybody has, has used a weapon or an implement uh, against another person, but any sort of indication of um, meaningful, serious violence, almost no matter how far back that is, mm -hmm. my encouragement to governors is to be cautious about that, and the presumption would be, with someone with a backstory like that, I would I would be reluctant to grant them HDC, and that's that's the guidance I'm giving to my, my governors now. I think over time, if we if we have a mature discussion about that in the light of experience, then it might well be um, that a, a, a different uh, consideration uh, might well emerge. But I think that will be based on experience and mature discussion. It might well be the view forms that my approach and SBS's approach currently is far too narrow, is um, too conservative in, in that sense, small c. Um, and that perhaps there is a more informed and mature view that will emerge over time. But I think at the moment our approach, I think, is reasonable uh, and, and probably necessary in order that we, we can establish some confidence moving forward in, in the HDC decision-making process. And the evaluation that you were suggesting? I think there needs to be two. There needs mm -hmm. to be one because HDC has been in place now for a number of years. And we now need to have an evaluation of HDC before these changes as to how effective that was that would be able to give us an informed decision of how, we, how to move forward. But we don't even collect the reconviction rates. And in reality, I think we should. Mm -hmm. um, I also think we need to look at the reintegration and quite how we'd research that, I'm not sure, but certainly it would be a very interesting comparator to see how the reconviction rates stack up mm -hmm. against the reconviction rates of people just released from prison and also those conviction reconviction rates of community orders. Mm -hmm. And I do think that's quite an important one. The second part is that anecdotally, we have many, many prisoners saying to us that HDC was actually a wake-up call, that they got out of prison and they could rethink their lives. You know, they actually had time on HDC in which they could rechange their lives and start again. That's an anecdotal experience. We need to back that up with proper research. The second part is after this current system has been in place, and I think the decision as to how many years it should be in place is one to be decided. But we should have a second evaluation because we then have the first evaluation and the reconviction statistics. The second evaluation will then tell us whether it's been just as useful a reintegration tool or whether in reality the reduction in HDC has seen a rise in the reconviction rates. So I think mm -hmm. the two mm -hmm. evaluations are critical before we can decide that the previous system was good, bad or indifferent and the current system is good, bad, or indifferent. That's helpful, thank you. Photo. Yeah. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, actually, uh, panel. Um, Mr McConnell, you'll be glad to, to know that my line of questions um, more on compliance and enforcement, so probably for Superintendent uh, Gary McEwen uh, in the first instance. Um, could you um, 
what, what are the arrangements in place for, for non-compliance? Could you perhaps actually even take, take us through um, the, the police process when somebody has, has breached, if you like? Um, Certainly. The, so, when someone is initially released on a home detention curfew, so the, you know, the decision has been made by the governor that he or she will be released back into the community, there is a notification now that will come into a single point of contact. And, I call it a single point of success now because that was one of the key issues that was identified around multiple points of failure. So in, in the old world, there was a number of different email addresses based on legacy force arrangements, and those, those emails sometimes did reach the source and other times didn't. So we now have a single point of success, as I would call it. So we get notification. That individual is then released into the, the community, uh, and he or she is rightly allowed to go about their business. They wear a, a tag, which is then monitored by G4S in Scotland, which is the supplier. So if that individual then breaches the curfew, and there are, are sort of four key issues around that. One is around removing or tampering with the device. The second one is around if they, you know, the curfew may be that he or she has to stay in doors from 10 o'clock every night until 8 o'clock the following morning. So if they leave the house during that, that point, then that's alerted and that's a breach. If they commit another offence, that's a breach, or a more uh, general one, which is keep the, keep the peace. So the bottom line is, if somebody breaches the, the, the conditions, then G4S notify the governor of the respective prison where they were released from, and the governor then makes a decision around whether they they basically announce or inform the police that that individual is now unlawfully at large. The reason I was hesitant there, because on some occasions they might not do that. They might actually go back to G4S and say, well, actually, let's just understand, maybe the maybe the tag was faulty, etc. So not, not on all occasions is that individual actually declared unlawfully at large. When they are, we then get a revocation of licence, uh, formal documentation from the prison service. We then disseminate that to the area in which we believe that that person resides, and then the local police officers will go and attempt to arrest them as part of the revocation of licence. And then he or she will be convened or taken back to the jail at the earliest opportunity thereafter. So that's the general process. That, that we now have in place between ourselves and the Scottish Prison Service. So how quickly would that happen between being informed by the Scottish Prison Service and action and officers out to search the individual? We, we hope now within 24 hours. So the initial part when somebody is released on home detention curfew, just generally we get notification seven days in advance of their release. So we know seven days in advance that they're coming out. But then when they breach the home detention curfew, we likely get notification formally from the prison service within 24 hours. And, and you've also got a role that you, you touched on there as well in monitoring persons released. Can you explain a bit about that, about how often that would be? Um, I, I'm assuming it would be dependent on the situation and the offences, but... Yep, so that's G4S that are actually the, re, the responsible authority for the ongoing monitoring. They have oversight and ownership of the devices, so it's them that would probably be alerted to the breach before the police. So, so sorry, I, I, I didn't make that clear that I wasn't referring to the monitoring of the, the devices. I was, I was meaning more in terms of police and uh, if there's social work involved visits. So, so we would... We, we don't have a statutory role in going doing visits, but we may well do as part of our sort of routine policing, go and do some announced visits just to, you know, there might be some intelligence coming around to suggest or otherwise that somebody's maybe getting back into bad relationships, maybe, you know, drugs or low level shoplifting or whatever it may be. So then that would be for the local officers to then make efforts to, to, to contact them and to try and if there's any referrals that are required through our vulnerable person database, maybe to criminal justice social work if the individual may be on the brink of reoffending, but they've not actually committed offence, then we have a, a key role to play there in trying to support or at least refer that individual for some support. And do you think that's something then that, that could be um, maybe tightened up a wee bit that there was actually, you know, a, a requirement almost for visits because where I was going to get to um, with that? Because because any situation for in my, my previous employment where I've been involved in that situation, there have been police visits, but they've obviously been established locally or or whatever as, as you've suggested. 
Um, and I think they worked really well, but the, the, the area I was going to get to was it, you would be able to perhaps pick up um, police or, or other agencies, as you said, be able to pick up that perhaps you know a breach is more likely, and then the, the information coming back the way as well as as well as coming from the SPS to you. I do think the police have a role. I, I would sort of offer some caution around making that you know obligatory that the police do that because these individuals are you know they've they've served their time, uh, they're out. You know, they're free citizens, albeit under a home detention curfew. So I think we need to be careful around the role and responsibility of the police. But I do think criminal justice, social work and other um, third-party or voluntary organisations that can provide that support, yes. But as I say, we do, you know, local officers, you know, they are tuned in to local intelligence mm -hmm. and local relationship building. So if there is an opportunity there to, to create an unannounced visit, then that does happen very regularly across the country just now. Thanks very much. I think it's been a, a useful line of um, questioning. But um, the, we, we, where, does, where does home detention, um, where does it sit in the priority list, if you like? And that's maybe a, a crude term, but if you take it with restriction of liberty orders and community payback orders, if they're breached, what, what would be the response in terms of priority? So, so now the home detention curfew breach, so unlawfully at large, is considered in policing terms as a category A. So is as high risk as any current outstanding warrants now where we look to have that individual incarcerated and brought back into to custody within twenty one days of within twenty one days of that unlawfully at large. Where and I did raise it at the last session we had around the electronic monitoring, where where the current guidance is very restrictive, however, is that we don't have the power to enter and search premises. So you know, we could go and check an address for, for Gary McEwen, but we have no power of entry. Whereas for apprehension warrants, as long as the police officer has the apprehension warrant in their, in their possession, they can force entry to any house and search that house for an individual. So that, that piece of legislation and power, I think, is, is a gap that I mentioned at the last session. Mm. And I also think there is a, another gap that I probably didn't articulate the best the last time, but it's actually... So, so I, I've tried to explain the process, which is G4S to the governor, to the police, but there are, there are occasions when the police officer may actually come across that individual. I call it the three o'clock in the morning. So they actually come across the individual at three o'clock in the morning. G4S are not aware that they've, they've breached their curfew at that point. The police officer comes across the individual who, in my mind, is probably presenting the greatest risk because they've breached their curfew, they're out, whatever they're doing, and the police have no power of arrest at that point. So we simply have to, we can note details, and if they are committing no other offence, we, we have to allow them to go on their way. And I would suggest that that's a real vulnerability, and I, again, at the last occasion I did mention it, where I think the police should be afforded some power of arrest as a non-officially accused, perhaps, where we take that individual into custody and then the notification procedure happens very quickly thereafter to the to the governor, etc. Whereas just now, realistically, we would take note details, allow that individual to go on their way and then notify the, the governor as quickly thereafter that, that individual has, has breached their curfew. And do you think that's something that would be useful? Um, to be included in, in the bill then as it goes through Parliament? I do very much so. That The power of arrest for those that are found in real time uh, having breached their, their home detention curfew and also the power of arrest, uh, sorry, the power of entry and search would certainly be another aspect that I would uh, encourage the committee to support. Thank you. And convener, just for the, uh, the record, I meant to say earlier that it was yeah, good right, answers right. to the line of question and not praising my own line of question. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> just to keep you... they picked up on that. <laughs> One of the key issues is individuals who are on home detention, curfew and, in, and reside in other jurisdictions uh, or have move abroad. Could you just clarify what the situation is when someone gives a, a, an address in, in England and what, what uh, the procedure is for ensuring that they're not breaching the curfew, and what happens if they, they do breach, if, if, if they uh, give an English address? Certainly. So the, <coughs> the position as is now is the, the single point of success. So the prison service would notify Police Scotland 
and then we would undertake to note. We put it on PNC and CHS, which are national systems, which alert any officer anywhere in the country if they come across that individual and they, they check the details out, then they'll get notification. So that's on an IT system. But we also now notify the respective police force in England and Wales that that individual is unlawfully at large and we pass down the paperwork that we get from the prison service down to the respective police force in England and Wales now and it is then their responsibility to undertake the, to prioritise and try and incarcerate that individual. So is it English law you'd be re relying on in terms of unlawfully at large as a, an offence in English law but not in Scotland currently, is that correct? And uh, no, it would be that because the the offence the the the, can, the custody came from here, then it would be your legislation that we would pass through. Okay. I would have thought so. I'm not a lawyer, but I would have thought so. Fine. Can I just also ask this, the the blunt question yep. regarding the the, the McLaren case? I mean, why did it take the police 69 days from the point of breach and the notification of that occurring, and you knock on the door? Is that simply because you didn't update SPS with your current email address? Because that, that would seem to be one of the implications from your previous answer. No, that, well, that wasn't meant to be. So the, if we're talking about the, you know, the tragic killing of Craig McClellan now, the, the HMIC done a review of that process and actually found that the processes were absolutely followed as they should be. So the, the notification arrangements from the prison service to Police Scotland, the updating the the respective national computer systems were all followed. So that that, you know, I talk about the previous life when, you know, the various emails that actually didn't happen in the, the tragic circumstances uh, with Craig, but the, the release of Mr. Wright, so that didn't happen. It was actually followed followed as it should have been was the commentary that came from the HMI. Well, just... Take sixty nine days just yep. As far as the notification process is concerned, Chief Superintendent McEwen is correct. That was followed in that particular instance um, and actually was within, well within 24 hours that the notification came. But what HMICS review was, was absolutely clear on that what happened thereafter was not acceptable and there certainly was not sufficient evidence to demonstrate a professional level of inquiry um, being made to actually apprehend James Wright and return him to prison. I mean, in your view, changing the category to, to sort of category A priority, which are, is that sufficient to ensure that that level of response it is what happens in the future? No. No. What would you like to see happen? No, it was a category A at the time. It was 14 <coughs> days under the previous standard operating procedures. Had it been, you know, there is this issue that, that's explained in the report about the difference between uh, a home detention curfew breach, a revocation licence and, um, and a warrant. But even, you know, the other high priority warrant would be 21 days. Regardless, Police Scotland didn't manage to meet any of those deadlines. Um, so that the deadline hasn't changed. There's nothing wrong with the standard operating procedures that existed. It's just that they weren't followed. That, that's quite a serious allegation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Chief Superintendent McEwen, I, so going back to the line that Fulton McGregor was pursuing, so if I may summarise briefly, reflect back what you've said. If the police suspect a breach of home detention curfew, there is no power of arrest at that point. If the SPS revoke a licence, you can arrest, but you can't enter a premises to search. Uh, in England and Wales, I believe there is a... You, you do have facility to do some of those things. Uh, now, you've already said to Mr McGregor that you feel that the bill should allow you to arrest on suspicion of a breach. Can we extrapolate from that to say, do you think that you need a similar ability to arrest? Do we need an offence of being unlawfully at large? Uh, and or do you need the ability to enter and search for those who've had a licence revoked? So there's probably three aspects there. So one is about the power of forced entry and search. Yes, I think that would be absolutely advantageous. Right. One for the, the power of a arrest at the point where 
that three o'clock in the morning scenario where the police are actually the first organisation to find that individual mm -hmm. before the, the current formal process, I think the police would benefit from a power of arrest at that point. Right. And the third one about an additional charge for somebody who has basically breached the revocation. I am supportive of that. I mean, if someone, and I'm probably statement to other territory here, but if somebody breaks out of prison, there is an offence there. Whereas if somebody, as it stands currently, breaches their home detention curfew, they simply get taken back into the prison and serve the remainder of their sentence. So there is no punishment and there is no deterrent then for this individual to actually, you know, not to breach the curfew. And I think if there was, then that may, uh, again, may be subject to, to review in three or five years' time. But that may be an additional deterrent to prevent these individuals from breaching their home detention curfew. It's very helpful. Thank you. I just finally ask you about communication, perhaps with two inspectors. You both re refer to that. Perhaps you could say specifically where, but can I pose one um, scenario where um, there is a legitimate reason for, for breaching? You've perhaps been rushed to hospital, and um, you know you, you then see that you're not supposed to be, you're not where you're supposed to be because of of that reason. Is there a problem currently with getting that information from? hospitals due to the data perfection. Um, when we the committee visited the WISE group, it was suggested there was an issue there. So I'd like to know if that um, was something you'd come across and how more generally you think communication, which is a theme that goes through so many reports um, with the police and um, other organisations, how that could be improved. Oh, HMICS certainly didn't come across that particular scenario. Um, I think um, Chief Superintendent McEwen's already referenced a number of reasons why an individual might not be uh, technically complying with their um, tag that are not necessarily in breach, as in committing another crime or being unlawfully at large. Um, the communication issue more widely um, absolutely was a feature of the review that HMICS carried out. Um, again, Mr McEwen's referenced the single point of contact now that's been established, and um, that isn't something that we've had an opportunity to test as yet, but as the committee will be aware, um, we will be revisiting the issues uh, of the home detention curfew process in six months' time, so we will be able to assess the difference that that single point of contact has made um, to the communication process mm -hmm. two-way between Police Scotland and the Scottish Prison Service. If I could pose that question to you, Ms Sinclair Gibbons, given particularly your comments on, on recall <coughs> and the need for more communication, I think you say between the SPS and the police, but perhaps we should be adding the NHS to, to that too, if, if it's relevant. I think communication for me was one of the key points in the report. Um, and by the way, please just call me Sinclair. I think the second half of my name is just much too difficult. Um, but yes, I mean, we certainly talked about, and there was a number of areas of communication that we made recommendations for. Uh, one of the ones that interested me is when someone had breached their licence or, or was expecting revocation, we didn't inform them, and we should be sending them a letter. Um, one of the ones was precisely that. I know that a number of people who end up with breaching of licence are because there's a technical system failure. They're dutifully at home in bed, but there's a technical system failure. I don't have those actual statistics to hand. But communication is key, and communication between the police to the people who are making the decision to release about their previous history of offending or intelligence held about serious and organised crime is one of the key points that we raised. Continued communication between the police and the SPS. And I agree with you with the NHS. There should be a way that the NHS can find he's got a tag. It's not hard to spot. And then actually be able to have a single point of contact to inform that that person has come into hospital if, say, they're unconscious. Um, there are numerous other reasons why people end up breaching that is really no fault of their own. That's just one of them.
It would be interesting, and perhaps um, if you could provide in written evidence any examples, Ripley Scotland, or um, you know that you know of where information has been refused under G, uh, the data protection rules. But obviously, the more we can identify the legitimate reasons for someone breaking it, means the rules these can then be targeted and looking at the people that really have to know that have breached them and are a danger to the public. That can be the SPS. the SPS. So, yes, gladly. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our, our questioning. Can I thank the, the panellists very much for what's been a very worthwhile um, session? And um, can we move straight on? Yes, we can suspend briefly for the witnesses to, to leave. Item three is consideration of a negative instrument, licensed legal services, complaints about approving regulators, Scotland regulations, 2018 SSSI, um, 2018 oblique 341. I refer members to paper five, which is noted by the clerk. Do members have any comments? John Finney. Thank you, Kavina. It's it's one I think I, I made fairly recently. Presumably, you either have an impact assessment which is shared or you don't. The fact that at paragraph 12 it talks about an impact assessment was discussed with the Law Society, and then at paragraph 13, a partial business and regulatory impact assessment. Um, I just find that quite peculiar. But I have no further comment to make. <laughs> of course. <laughs> we will feed that back to. Um, to the manager for business who's been taking a, a particular um, interest in, in SSIs, and I'm sure he'll find that very helpful. Are there any other comments? If not, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed, thank you. Agenda item four is feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on policing on its meeting on the 15th of November. Re I refer members to paper six, which is noted by the clerk, and following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for comments or questions from members. John Finney. Thank you, Camina. You rightly identified that the most recent meeting was on the 15th of November, and that, that was where we heard our fourth um, piece of evidence on Peace Scotland's proposals to introduce a digital device triage system, which is also known as cyber kiosk to, uh, attention to interrogate mobile phone data and their intention to um, bring that in in Scotland next month. The subcommittee took evidence uh, from representatives of the Information Commissioner's Office, Police Scotland, the Scottish Human Rights Commission and the Faculty of Advocates. And the main focus of that evidence was to determine whether Police Scotland had a legal basis to introduce this new technology. Police Scotland had, had requested legal advice from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, but this was not provided ahead of the meeting. And I should say that this was an issue that was raised right at the outset of the subcommittee's deliberations in May of this year, so that was disappointing. The subcommittee did he hear that, that there's not a, a bespoke piece of legislation that covers the use of this technology, and that as a result of that, Police Scotland rely on a complex mix of legal methods to seize and examine an electronic device. And this would include the use of judicial warrants, reliance on common and case law, or statutory powers. And again, I think it's fair to record that committee members uh, understood there were uh, protections in place um, for accused and indeed suspects, but with some specific issues around uh, the position of witnesses or complainers. The sub subcommittee uh, was told that legislation had got kept placed with technology. Uh, legality was an issue not just for the proposed use of this technology, but Police Scotland's approach to accessing any digital media 
and biometric data. Um, it was certainly the view of the Faculty of Advocates, the Scottish Human Rights Commission and the Information Commissioners uh, that legal clarity should be uh, uh, in place before uh, the cyber chaos be introduced. And given the serious concerns raised about whether the legal framework was fit for purpose for accessing data, as well as the human rights, privacy and data protection implications of introducing cyber chaos, the subcommittee agreed to write to the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and the Chief Constable to seek their views on the evidence we received. And these letters went off today. The subcommittee will next meet on the 6th of December when it will hold an evidence session on Police Scotland's role in the immigration process and community relations. Do members have any comments? No. Liam, yeah, yeah. That was completely clear. Uh, you talked about the Faculty of Advocates about the, the legal framework, and it, it says in this summary the law requires to be changed prior to introduction. D does that mean that she was saying, look, we need to look at this and sort it all out, or was it saying, if the law is not changed, this cannot legally be brought into force? It certainly was the view of the Faculty of Advocates, the Information Commissioner and the Sc Scottish Human Rights Commissioner that there wasn't a sound legal basis to bring this in. But so it none... could be brought in without <coughs> breaching a law, but it would be very inadvisable to do so. Is that... It's not how I would pa paraphrase it. They were oh. very concerned that there wasn't sufficient legal basis I around see. which it would operate. But they also, looking ahead, were concerned that the technology is racing ahead of legislation and not not just the technology, but the amount of information that's available in technology. So metaphors were given about searching a house, and at one time you might get a warrant to search the cupboard. Well, the information that's stored on people's devices is about their entire private life, their finances, their mm -hmm. relationships and everything. So there was concerns that technology would be expanding, even um, you know, as on a daily basis, basically. Understand. But Thank the sufficiency you. of the legal, um, uh, the legal basis just now, we're still awaiting a, a judgment from the Crown Procurator Fiscal Service, so that, that will be coming. Liam McArthur? Yeah, I, I think um, that issue that it wasn't just the faculty raised, I think it was accepted across the, the, the panel, and um, I think it was also agreed that cyber kiosks had been kind of the portal into this, but it had opened up um, a, a, a breadth of area where um, the, the, the legal basis was 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 not particularly sound, and, and, and I think the legal um, the, the requirement to to to, to uh, up, update the law was was increasingly evident. I mean, I I, I think John's described the process very fairly that that this was this was something where I think Police Scotland were of a view that this was um, that this was hugely beneficial to them and um, to those who had their, their their mobile devices taken off them but returned more quickly than would be the case previously and therefore um, had, had proceeded without I think due care and attention what was what was interesting about um, the approach in this last session was there was an acceptance uh, across the board that um, that, that uh, lessons had to be uh, had to be learned. And I think Police Scotland, um, for all their failings, um, to some extent, uh, I think um, came across as as being very open to that. And, and the other the other stakeholders, I think, were, were giving them due credit for the way in which they'd engaged through the external stakeholder group over the last couple of months. I think it's fair to say as a result of the evidence session where there was a presumption that they would be going ahead end of December, I think that was being questioned and it was very much um, emphasised that um, it's not even a need to get it right, they can't afford to get it wrong. It's so important that we get this right and you know have the right circumstances in which these cyber chaos are being used. If there are no more questions, that concludes the Justice Committee's 30th meeting for 2018. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, 27th of November when we'll continue our evidence taking on the Vulnerable Witnesses Bill. Move into private session. Before you